Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for coming this evening. Um, our, our presenter is an assistant professor at the University of Texas in Arlington and chair of the Advisory Council on Underwater Archaeology. She is also a leading researcher in the archaeology of hunters and gatherers and has worked extensively at both the terrestrial and underwater projects across the world. She's also an expert in ancient submerged landscapes in the Americas, where she's worked on play, uh, such sites in the Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean, and in the Great Lakes region, which she's gonna be talking about today. I would like to introduce Dr. Ashley Lemke. Welcome Dr. Lemke, and thank you so much for coming this evening. Thank you, April, and, and thank you to the Conservancy so much for, for having me. It's a real, it's a real pleasure to uh, be giving this talk today. Thank you. All right. I'm very distracted by all my friends in the chat. So hello, everyone. <laughs> it's so wonderful, um, especially those of you in Germany who just chimed in that you were you're here at 1 a.m. So we, we really appreciate you um, coming to this talk today. So uh, to get started, I would like to just respectfully acknowledge the Wichita and affiliated tribes upon whose historical homelands the University of Texas at Arlington, where I work, is located, and to recognize the historical presence of the Caddo Nation and other tribal nations in this region from North Texas, where I'm, I'm calling in from today. So today I'm going to talk about archaeology underwater, how submerged landscapes are, are really changing the, the future of the field, and I'm going to do that by sharing some research that I do in the Great Lakes. and. I want to start by, of course, I, I can't I can't give an underwater archaeology talk and, and no one can give an underwater archaeology talk without first having a picture of a shipwreck. Uh, when we, we think of the phrase or hear the phrase underwater archaeology, this is often what we think about these really dynamic captivating images of of ships lost at sea of of catastrophic you know failures or, or warfare or these sunk ships that represent these these kind of time capsules of, of history and shipwrecks are, are fascinating my colleagues on the advisory council of underwater archaeology do amazing work in nautical archaeology but one of the things that myself and, and many colleagues work on are, are things that are actually much older than shipwrecks that also happen to be underwater so I want to talk just briefly about this kind of concept of a, a frozen moment in time, like that shipwreck that's in Lake Huron you just saw, and like Pompeii, arguably one of the world's most famous archaeological sites. There was a volcanic eruption of Mount Vesuvius, which covered over Pompeii and one of its sister cities, and it left us with this, you know, ideal archaeological site that was completely frozen, frozen in time where you could walk in it, it was almost like going back in back in a time machine where you could see all of the artifacts exactly where they were left. And this isn't something that archaeologists often get. We would love, you know, for every site to be like Pompeii, but where I work is extremely different than Pompeii. Rather than a, a frozen in time city, you have sites like this, which is called Dragon, Lake Huron's frozen in time hunting blind. So in this case, rather than volcanic ash or lava covering up archeological sites, you have the water instead covering up these sites that are very old. And this type of archeology span is often referred to as submerged landscape archeology. span So they were sites that were once dry land, but are now underwater. And the really significant difference here between shipwrecks and, and submerged landscapes is just how old they can be. These tend to be archeological sites that are from the very deep past that are preserved underwater. So doing submerged landscape studies is, is not the easiest kind of research in the world. It's truly interdisciplinary where you have to have very large teams of scientists from different fields working together. First to understand the fluctuations in, in global water levels over time, why there were these sites that were dry land and, and now they're submerged, how did that happen? We work with paleo environmentalists or um, paleo limnologists, folks who study past environments of inland waters like the Great Lakes. And of course you have archeologists like myself and anthropologists also like myself, all working together to understand this evidence of, of human life and human activity that's underwater. 
Now, this is becoming an, an increasingly important part of the global archaeological record. It's becoming more and more recognized that our, there are a number of archaeological sites that are in lakes, in rivers, on our continental shelves. And some of these in our in North America, where I am, have had extremely important impacts on the archaeological record. Um, Page Ladson is a site that submerged in Florida. It's one of the earliest or oldest archaeological sites that's in the US now. There are many, many, many others that are all over the world. And it's a new kind of field and a, an acknowledgement that there's a lot of really unique special archaeological sites that are underwater and archaeologists need to go and, and get down there and start excavating them. So submerged landscapes, of course, are, are not unique to uh, North America. There are entire continents that were once drowned, uh, like Dodgerland you see here on this Google Earth image. All of that very shallow kind of light blue color would have been dry land at the end of the last ice age. Folks and researchers in Australia have mapped what they refer to as the super highways that the first Australians would have used to cross to get into the continent when water levels were much lower. And these global processes of, of sea level rise or sea level fluctuation are really mirrored on the smaller regional level in the Great Lakes, where there was a lot of dynamic changes in these lake basins over the last you know, 10,000, 12,000, even earlier years. And all five of the Great Lakes experienced changes in their water levels that resulted in both high water stands, where the levels were higher than they are today, and also low water stands where they're much lower than they are today. And this is one image showing you what Lake Stanley, the Lake Stanley time period would have looked like in the Lake Huron Basin, specifically where I work. The land, or excuse me, the water was so much lower that there was much more available land for prehistoric indigenous inhabitants to be able to occupy. And one of these pieces of land is the Alpena Amberley Ridge. This would have offered a dry land corridor for both peoples and animals from around 11,000 to 8,000 years ago. Uh, this image that you're looking at is from the National Geographic show Drain the Great Lakes. If any of you are, are familiar with that program, they do drain the oceans. This was a, a Drain the Great Lakes episode where they digitally lowered the water of what it would have looked like around 9,000 years ago. So everything green in this image is the modern land surface of Michigan and Ontario. And everything that's tan, that light brown color, is mostly that, that central column there is the Alpena Amberley Ridge. So all of that extra land surface would have been available for, for human occupation. It's over 250,000 hectares of land that was dry. And it's now anywhere between about 80 and 120 feet underneath Lake Huron now. And there's a wonderful, amazing archeological record that dates a cultural occupation down there to just around 9,000 calibrated years ago. So why, why work on the Alpena Amberley Ridge? Um, it's 50 miles offshore. It's in about hundred feet of water. It's not the easiest place to get to necessarily but it preserves a really extremely unique 9,000 year old environment. So evidence of, a, of an ancient paleo environment, but also an archeological record that is characterized by complex caribou hunting groups of foragers that had extremely extensive social networks. So it took about 10 years and a big group of folks all collaborating and working together for me to tell you that sentence. Uh, and we'll walk through some of the evidence now of that very complex archeological record that's, that's down below the waters of Lake Huron. The very first thing for, for underwater archeology, span particularly of these submerged landscapes and looking in a place where, where people haven't looked before is to characterize the bottom lands or the seabed what exactly does the Alpena Amberley Ridge look like in terms of its topography? And there's extensive surveys that myself and others have collaborated on using both side scan and multi-beam sonar in pretty large areas. You then go and characterize the bottomlands even further and start investigating what you see on side scan and multi-beam sonar using remote operated vehicles 
So you can see one here, its name is Jake. This is a, a very good friend of mine. It's our, our, our research workhorse down there on the bottom on the Apina Amberley Ridge. And also using things like autonomous underwater vehicles who do side scan as well. They look sort of like torpedoes where you put them in the water, but they can get very close to the bottom and give you really high resolution sonar imagery of the overall bottom land landscape, but also archaeological sites. So understanding the, the paleo environment of the Alpina Amberley Ridge was an extremely important part of this project because you have to understand what that dry land landscape would have been like to then start wondering and hypothesizing about where prehistoric peoples would have then been living. So characterizing a, a prehistoric landscape, no matter where you are, even if you're on dry land can be tricky, but underwater we really benefit from organic preservation. So one of the reasons why underwater archeology span is, is really worth the extra effort is that limited oxygen environment preserves organic materials, things like wood and plant remains that we normally don't have in terrestrial archeological sites. So one of the big components of working on the Alpena Amberley Ridge was collaborating with geoarchaeologists, understanding you know, the sand and the rocks and the landscape, also looking for things like those macro botanicals, pieces of wood, rooted trees that might be preserved down on the bottom in about, a, again, 100 feet of water, and really understanding what this dynamic ancient environment would have looked like. And fortunately, I can not just tell you, but show you what it looks like on the, the bottom of the Alpena Amberley Ridge. So this is what it looks like on a dive. This is in about 85 feet of water. And Derek, one of the folks that were, uh, one of the divers on the project was heading back up to the boat and was like, look down here, look at this. These are, you'll see, this is one piece of wood that's coming into focus. And the green that you're seeing here, there's a lot of algae. And there's also invasive zebra and quagga mussels that cover up a lot of the, the hard surface on the bottom of Lake Huron. But there, there's that long skinny piece of wood and then this other large piece of wood that are just resting down there on the surface. So you can see they're not buried. We didn't need to excavate them. They're just on the surface of the Alpena Amberley Ridge. And that's a 9,000 year old piece of wood <laughs> that had been waiting a, a very long time for, for us to come and find it. So the preservation that's available in this very cold, very fresh water is really unmatched. We don't have anything like that on land in the Great Lakes. It's really worth the effort to, to go down there. And since we have rooted trees that are still intact and we have these larger pieces of wood, I can show you the other image here. This is what the Alpena Amberley Ridge likely would have looked like when it was dry land. A pretty flat, you know, post-glacial landscape with patches of, of spruce and tamarack trees, patches of, of marshes and, and bogs and small kettle ponds. So that's what it would have looked like 9,000 years ago when it was dry land. One of the newest things that happened just this past summer in July so we go and we do a lot of sonar research first, and then we start investigating these anomalies or, or targets, things that show up on the sonar that look pretty unique. And we saw a long sinuous line, so we decided to go and look at it via the remote operated vehicle, the underwater robot. And it looked kind of just, you know, like a rock feature, things that we'd seen before. There's a, a piece of wood actually sticking out here on the surface. So before you send scuba divers underwater, of course, particularly in that in that cold, deep water, you want to get a good sense of of what you're looking at. So there was a, a piece of wood. We decided to, to just go down and, and look at what looked like this kind of rock line feature. This is to give you a better sense again of, of what it looks like on the bottom. This is my colleague, John O'Shea. And it still looks, you know, you can kind of see it in the background in that mist. Some of these pieces of of what we presume were rocks. And this is Tyler Schultz, one of our collaborators that 
was able to cut into what we thought was rock uh, down here on the bottom in about 80, 85 feet of water. And what this ended up being was not a rock line like we suspected from the sonar image. This is actually a deposit of peat. Peat is something that is extremely wonderful for terrestrial archaeologists if you find a peat bog because it's a no oxygen environment. It's a partially kind of disintegrated or, or um, plant material, and it can pro provide amazing organic preservation. So those of you might be familiar um, in the audience with bog bodies, the, the bog bodies that are found in places like Denmark that are preserved in peat bogs where you have this natural mummification. So finding a peat bog underwater was not something that we expected. We took samples of it and brought it up topside to the boat. And this is really going to even further revolutionize what we know about the paleo environment on the Alpena Amberley Ridge. So this is a, a photo of me cutting up and, and, and dissecting this peat sample, the very first one we brought up. And you can see in this image with the ruler, those little orange circles that are in that, those are seeds. There's leaves, there's macro botanicals. Again, all of this is preserved. We have a colleague that's working on the preserved pollen from this. And we have two radiocarbon dates from the top and the bottom. And these are 9,000 year old seeds that are preserved underwater. So again, completely worth the effort. Uh, keep your fingers crossed. We're gonna go and, and sample more of this this summer. And if there are gonna be organic artifacts, things like hunting weapons or wood or basketry or textiles, this is exactly where you would expect that to preserve. So we're gonna do some more sampling in the summertime. So that's all the paleo environment. It's important to know what the paleo environment was like because these are you know, dry land, they were dry land landscapes. What were they like when people were living on them? Once you understand the landscape, you can start hypothesizing where people would have been living and you can really start doing archeology span underwater, looking for sites, looking for features, things like artifacts. This should look like exactly like archeology span looks on land, right? You have some folks with clipboards, writing down notes, measuring the different artifacts and sites and features that are found on the bottom. And what's really been fantastic about the Alpena Amberley Ridge is the stone constructed architecture for hunting that's been found there. So these are the first kinds of archeological sites that we found on the bottom. This has been the focus of most of my research is analyzing these, these hunting structures. So the black and white image you see at the top, there's two lines that create a funnel feature. That's from dry land, that's from Victoria Island in, in British Columbia, and that's a hunting site for hunting caribou. These are called drive lanes. They create these stone lines on the landscape that caribou get kind of attracted to, and then they just follow them and they start getting funneled and, and captured before they even realize they're, they're funneled and captured. And it's a way to just slightly modify the landscape, but really draw in those animals. So you're not chasing them around. You kind of lure them to you using these kinds of, of hunting structures. And that's very similar to the kinds of architecture that's found below Lake Huron. So again, there isn't a lot of sediment. There isn't a lot of deposition down there. These hunting structures are just right on the surface. The bottom image that's labeled like Huron, that's that kind of yellow um, color, yellow tan, is a side scan sonar image showing a caribou drive lane that's at the same scale to the one in Victoria Island. The other image is showing a hunting blind so these features are really fantastic because, again, they're on the surface. They have correlates on land. We know what they were used for. We know that they were used for hunting. This is a, a 3D, what's called photogrammetry model of, of one of the hunting sites. Again, you can kind of see a, a funneling feature. So this is just a lot of digital images that have been combined to make a, a 3D image of a site that's called the funnel that's down below in Lake Huron. So all of these kinds of features I refer to as, as hunting architecture, because that's, that's what they're for. They're funneling features. They're in the shapes of lines or, or these circle or half circle blinds. They create corrals. And this is some of the oldest hunting architecture that's been documented on the planet, which is really fantastic. There's over 60 of these structures that have so far been identified in three different research areas. There are anywhere from pretty simple hunting blinds, things that are, are V-shaped where just one or two 
hunters could kneel down and be concealed. And that's in contrast with things that are more complex, that are the larger structures that have drive lanes. Occasionally, these, these act together where you'll have drive lanes with, with hunting blinds on, on either side. So these range, again, from these kind of simple constructions to more complex constructions that are larger. And one of the really unique things about these types of, of hunting features, including the ones that are submerged below Lake Huron, is they can tell you the season that they were used in, which sounds like an interesting thing that you can tell just by rock features that are on the landscape. But across the Alpena Amberley Ridge, caribou would have migrated basically from the wintering grounds to um, more northern like rutting grounds and then breeding grounds right where they would then have their calves so caribou are, are the longest distance migrating animals in north america there are caribou bones and remains from terrestrial arch terrestrial archaeological sites in the region we think people during this time period would have been hunting caribou the sites look like they're for hunting caribou and depending on the way that they're oriented, what direction they're oriented, you can match them to the direction that caribou would have been migrating. So just based on their orientation, you can get a sense that people on the Alpena Amberley Ridge 9,000 years ago were hunting caribou during both their spring and their fall migrations, utilizing these types of hunting features. Now, I have to do this because my book just came out. I just got the very first copy of the book on Monday. If you want to know more about the Lake Huron hunting architecture, but actually hunting architecture all over the world, uh, this was Texas A&M University Press and the Center for Study of the First Americans sponsored this book, which is fantastic. And it's all color imagery, which usually never happens. So this is available now on Amazon, um, but really, really exciting. It's a book that's been a very long time in the making. All right, so you have the paleo environment and then you have the archeological record of these stone hunting features on the Alpena Amberley Ridge. But then you have archeological sites, right? And you have the features and you know their environmental background. What was then even more important for excavating and understanding these archeological sites, excavating through the shallow dirt that is there was looking for artifacts, right? Looking for artifacts and materials, doing archeological testing. So using a range of methods, we've taken samples, we've excavated in, in one by one meter squares and hundred feet of water, just like you would do on land. And so far have had a range of stone tools or mostly debitage, right? A lot of these are flakes, things that we refer to as debitage because they just fall off when you're sharpening a stone tool or kind of recycling a stone tool and making it something else, you get these flakes from creating a stone tool that are left over. So that's what most of these are that you're looking at. Uh, the very bottom one that looks like a triangle where it says two centimeters, that's actually a tooth fragment. So it's too small to identify to a particular type of animal, but we can tell that it's a cervid, part of the cervid family, which includes deer and caribou. So there's a very limited uh, sample of zooarchaeological remains or animal bones that have just been found. Next to that, you actually have what's called a thumbnail scraper. These are very common in Paleo-Indian and a little bit later archaeological sites in the area. They're called thumbnail scrapers because they're used usually to scrape wood or scrape hides, but they grind down through use and eventually become the size of just your fingernail when they get discarded. So that's a, a what we call a bifacial tool, a thumbnail scraper that's down from one of the larger complex hunting structures in Lake Huron. But these ones that are in the top corner actually became a very large story just in and of themselves. So those, that image is showing you two, two sides, right? Both sides of, of just two flakes, so pieces of debitage again. And this is a, a publication that we just put out last year with a number of colleagues, because those two very small flakes are actually obsidian, a type of material that's a volcanic glass. Just like peat, obsidian is a really wonderful material for archeologists because it can be traced to its source. So these are the two little pieces of obsidian flakes. You can see the scale there, that's two millimeters. They're very, very small. They were recovered in a small sample from the bottom taken right next to one of these archeological sites. 
And because they're volcanic glass, you can trace them. So this is first just showing you a image of where they came from on the bottom or very near where they came from. This is what it looks like when we take a sample. So we leave these, these markers on the bottom. We can get the exact GPS coordinates using the remote operated vehicle so we know where these came from. The image here is just a map. It's showing you a green, again, the green, right, is our modern land surface. The brown is what would have been dry land towards the end of the last ice age. Those square red boxes are where we've done most of our research. And DA1 is the sample that these two obsidian flakes came from. So again, just showing you, this is the, the type of archaeology that takes place. And again, the fantastic thing about obsidian is you can trace it geochemically. So that type of rock has a really specific signature that can tell you where its volcanic source is. So using a series of methods, so I have both of these up here for you, energy dispersive X-ray fluorescence and neutron activation analysis. These are both types of studies that you can do on obsidian to help source it. And the map is showing you where these two flakes came from. So two very small obsidian flakes from Lake Huron actually traced all the way back to a source called Wagon Tire that's in Eastern Oregon. So this is a distance of over 4,000 kilometers. The other figure on the side is just showing a sample of two of the elements, sodium and, manganese, and manganese, that were traced. And you can see that the two samples were compared to a range of different obsidian sources. So they were compared to the geochemical signature of obsidian, not just from North America or South America, but actually very large databases from the whole world. And these two flakes match the wagon tire source in Central Oregon most closely. So this was a fantastic discovery because they're very small flakes, but they have a very large tail to tell us. It's extremely unlikely that one person would have walked right with these two flakes in their pocket all the way from, from Central Oregon to the Great Lakes 9,000 years ago. So what we hypothesize is this is an indication of trade and, and exchange networks or just social networks that would have reached across you know, what is now the United States and, and the central part of, of North America. We tend to think that people maybe 9,000 years ago weren't as connected as we are now, but that tends not to be the case. They always surprise us. Uh, the archeological record tends to have a lot of surprises, particularly things like this. So that's one of the, the newer discoveries in Lake Huron that's published. Um, that paper, I'm happy to share a link to it in the chat at the end, it's open access. So it's completely free and available for anybody that wants to read more about that particular discovery. So one of the most important things um, for me as a researcher, but also about submerged landscapes in general, is that we're really doing anthropology underwater. So it tends to get, you know, really tech, tech savvy and, and sonar heavy. And there's a lot of these ranges of techniques and methods that we use that we wouldn't use on land. But again, it's, it's worth all this extra effort and it's worth, you know, working together and creating new methods for exploring these submerged landscapes, because this is a virtually intact 9,000 year old landscape. You know, um, a lot of old archeological sites on land have been impacted by construction or agriculture or development, you know, all these different, these different activities that humans do now that can really impact the archaeological record, but no one's living on the bottom, the bottom of Lake Huron, right? These sites are almost like that Pompeii frozen in time aspect, where you have a good handle on how old they are. You have chronological control because you have preserved wood and preserved trees that you can radiocarbon date. We also have radiocarbon dates on the peat, like I mentioned. There's actually a piece of charcoal that was found in the middle of a stone ring. It looked just like a campfire, and that also radiocarbon dated to 9,000 years ago. So we have a really good handle on how old these archaeological sites are. We don't always have that on land, particularly in the Great Lakes. There's this preservation aspect of, of working underwater where you have wood and organics and these types of, of materials that terrestrial archaeologists don't, don't always have to work with. So it's, you know, there's, there's pluses and minuses, of course. I, I work on land too, and there's wonderful archaeological sites terrestrially. But the important thing to remember is we're never going to have the whole picture 
of what life was like for prehistoric peoples if we ignore, you know, the archaeological record that's that's underwater now. Our their shores didn't stop at at our modern shoreline, so it's important to to get down there and and see what kind of archaeological evidence is preserved. One of the really fascinating parts and, and really fun parts of this project moving forward, and that's currently under development with colleagues uh, in Alaska and at Wayne State University in their computer science program, is an immersive virtual reality program. So the Alpena Amberley Ridge is big. It's a very large spot to try to do these sonar surveys and map. Underwater archaeology can be very expensive. So one of the methods that we've collaborated on is a virtual reality model of the Alpena Amberley Ridge, what it would have looked like when it was dry land. And we have agent based little caribou simulate a uh, little computer simulated caribou that migrate across this virtual reality landscape and people can enter it in virtual reality and walk across the Alpena Amberley Ridge the way it would have looked when it was dry land 9000 years ago. So one of the most recent developments and, and what's so fascinating and fun is working with traditional hunters. So we took this virtual reality program up to Alaska um, in 2018 and then in 2019 and work with the Western Arctic Caribou Hood Working Group and the native village of Kotzebue, people who hunt caribou all the time. They know a lot more about it than I do. And they can enter this virtual reality program and hunt caribou in on the Alpena Amberley Ridge 9,000 years ago. So this is combining indigenous knowledge, folks that have a lot of traditional knowledge about types of environments like this and hunting caribou in environments like this, and combining it with computer science and artificial intelligence to give us a better idea of how caribou were being hunted, but also where to look for archaeological sites, right? Not all the spots on the Alpena Amberley Ridge are as good for caribou hunting as others. So this is giving us another tool and another method to collaborate with indigenous peoples, but also to understand where archaeological sites might be located so we can narrow in those sonar searches a little bit better. I wanted to show just a couple of slides about what this looks like when you're in the virtual reality program. Again, these are um, fantastic, fantastic graduate students and postdocs and professors that are working with us at Wayne State University that are creating this, this virtual landscape. Uh, it's fantastic because they're not just guessing where the water or the trees are. You know, we have all that wonderful data that's preserved underwater. So we can say, hey, we found a rooted tamarack tree here, you know, underwater, put it in the, the virtual world, the virtual environment. This is what it looks like if you were standing on the shore of the Alpena Amberley Ridge looking out on what would have been ancient Lake Stanley. And importantly for us as scuba divers, you can even go off the Alpena Amberley Ridge down into the water into Lake Stanley. Um, and so they've done all of this in, in really wonderful detail in the virtual reality program. So you can really get this sense of what it's like being on the Alpena Amberley Ridge, and then eventually, again, hunting caribou and, and seeing what that environment would have looked like. So one of the most important things uh, for me as a professor, of course, is always, you know, what are we contributing to archaeology broadly as a field? What are we contributing to, you know, archaeology in the region of the Great Lakes, but also what are we contributing for the next generation of, of archaeologists? So working on the Alpena Amberley Ridge has provided a really dynamic and unique picture of a better understanding, right, of indigenous populations in the Great Lakes at the end of the last ice age. There's only so much we can do with the terrestrial record. There's only so much we can do with the underwater record. So putting them together in the Great Lakes has been really useful for getting a better understanding of indigenous populations. Nobody thought that they were building these stone structures for hunting caribou, right? Until we found evidence of them on the bottom of Lake Huron. The anthropologically relevant underwater research just means making sure that we're not just looking at stone tools for the sake of looking at stone tools, but we're understanding how artifacts and features and sites all work together to tell us about the peoples that lived in the past and also working with populations today and doing community-based archeology, span really working with caribou hunters and, and understanding um, different perspectives and different viewpoints of, of the past. And lastly, 
in terms of this giving back to the next generation, uh, I took a group of students from the University of Texas at Arlington. We went and did a field school last year in Lake Huron. So training the next generation of archeologists that are water and technology savvy is, is a really important component of this project. And of course, of, of my research and, and teaching as a faculty member. So they were very cold because <laughs> these are a lot of Texans that were up in the really cold, you know, 40 degree water in, in Lake Huron. But it's a wonderful place for training opportunities as well. So in terms of, of bringing us full circle and, and hearkening back to the title of the talk, you know, how, how are submerged landscapes changing the future of the field or changing the future of archaeology? Sometimes it looks remarkably similar. <laughs> so even though in this case you have one person breathing compressed air and the other person is not, archaeology underwater is just like archaeology on land. You know, archaeology is archaeology is archaeology. The point of it is to understand peoples in the past, their life ways, um, you know, their rituals, their religions, their economies, their diets, their behaviors. And submerged landscapes are providing new kinds of data that we don't always have on land. They're providing new types of archaeological sites that we do not always have on land. They're really in that way providing a counterpoint to the terrestrial archaeological record. And when you combine them both together, we're going to have the most holistic view of the past. And in terms of careers and jobs and looking forward to the future of archaeology, there's a lot of offshore development, things like wind farms that are happening in the United States, but also all over the world. And it's important that while this new oceanic development happens, we protect and preserve the archaeological sites that are underwater. All of our historical and even earlier shipwrecks, but also sites like this that aren't always so easy to find. So training that next generation of students and training also the next generation of people to be aware of how much cultural heritage is underwater is really important. So it's not only changing the future of the field from a perspective of, of new data, but it's given a lot of us, certainly me, a lot of new ideas about the past and is also gonna give us a lot of new kinds of careers as well for archeologists in the future. So with that, I would like to thank you all so much for attending the talk. And this is a, a small list of, of collaborators that have worked together on this project, um, as well as the National Science Foundation, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and National Geographic have all provided support for this research. And with that, I'm very happy to take any questions we might have. Excellent. That was really incredible. That, that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And we have, we have, I have been collecting questions um, throughout the lecture. So I'm going to start tackling them and then I'll, I'll start grabbing some that are coming in live as well. Okay. Um, so one of our viewers asked about your side scan search. Um, they asked what specific features might be detected um, when you're looking at a, looking for a prehistoric submerged site. Mm. Do you concentrate on submerged riverbeds, streams, peninsulas, or are you looking for more micro features? Great question. So all of the things you listed for, for sure. So doing side scan sonar survey, looking at these kind of macro scale features on the bottom lands is, is what one of the things it's very good at. So seeing things like ancient river channels or where there's exposed rock versus sand. So differences in the texture of the bottom lands, what it's composed of. And in our case, we got extremely lucky that a lot of those hunting structures were large enough in scale, right? Where, and they were on the surface that side scan sonar could detect those as well. So for prehistoric sites, um, particularly those that are on the continental shelf, um, a number of my colleagues are, are working on even better methods to find things that are smaller. Um, so those small obsidian flakes, right, that are two centimeters, like we're never gonna be able, well, maybe we can, Marty Klein is on this phone call. Maybe Marty can develop a, a type of sonar that can do that. So you're usually not seeing things at the scale of an individual artifact bigger sites, bigger features from an archaeological perspective. And then a lot of it is just starting to understand the landscape. So exactly right, like the examples you provided, um, river channels, you know, peninsulas, things like that. Okay. One of our viewers asked, what was 
what was the best preservation or find that was saved because it was stored underwater and not underground? In Lake Huron, we think, or anywhere. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, you're muted, April, if you're, if you're talking to me. <laughs> we'll assume that you're taught, they're talking about the area that you, you presented. <laughs> I'm gonna say so far, so far, because my fingers are crossed, we're gonna find more. Um, there's a 9,000 year old intact rooted tree and it's rooted. So it's not just on the landscape, you know, floating around or, or even just resting. It's toppled over slightly, but it's, it's rooted and intact. So it told us that when the water rose, right, when the ice sheets started melting and when the water rose in the Great Lakes, that it did it gently enough that it didn't just wash away, right? All the archeology span or topple all these trees, they kind of toppled over, but they're still rooted in the ground. Um, we do have one piece of wood that is clearly modified. So it's not a natural piece of wood. Um, the ends have been rounded. There's a lot of cut marks on it. And um, to be completely honest, it's, it's driving myself a little crazy because we're having a hard time radiocarbon dating it. Um, so I would say so far it's like the pollen and the trees that are the most fantastic things that have been uh, preserved because they're underwater. We don't have that on land, particularly in the Great Lakes. The region is the soil is really acidic in the Great Lakes area. So things like bone and things like wood and plants just don't preserve very well in terrestrial sites. So we had several um, questions specifically about the peat. Mm. Um, how deep is the sediment that covers archeological features there? And I'm, I think you, you were, it was at a specific point during your presentation. So um, I didn't capture the timestamp. And if it was pressed in a linear form, is it possible that it was a peat house? Ooh, okay. So the good, the good kind of good news, bad news on the, Archeo on the Alpena Amberley Ridge is in general, the features are on the landscape, right? They're not buried. I mentioned that a couple of times. So that's why we were able to discover them using side scan sonar. There is places, there are places where there's some sediment and it's all ancient sediment. So one of the primary research areas we work is 50 miles offshore. So there's, there's no way where like modern sand or dirt is, is getting to bury these archeological sites. The, the sediment is not that deep. The places where there are pockets of sediment is maybe, maybe 10 inches, maybe 12 inches. Most of it is either even shallower than that, just a thin lens, or there's some of these kind of beach ridges that are old beaches <laughs> that are a little bit deeper. The peat itself is about 20 centimeters, at least on the exposed edge where we've been looking. So the peat is a deeper deposit, which is great. Um, and it could be deeper in other areas. So that exposure, the line of the peat was a hundred feet. So it's a huge exposure of peat that we quite literally have just tapped the, the surface of. So it could be deeper in other areas. Stay tuned uh, for the research this summer. In terms of a peat house, we don't have evidence of that quite yet. Um, the sample that we took um, is about a brick. We took like two samples that are about a size of a, of a brick. And both of those have distinct layers in them that have leaves and, and seeds and these macro botanicals. So, so far it looks to be really natural and not like made into a structure. And the last question I had about Pete was someone asked, why does it create a form of boulders? It says. Yeah, so it looks like boulders. What happened is there was an exposure of peat and there's a tiny bit of sand underneath the peat, at least from the, the profile that we have. So it looks like the peat exposure was bigger and then the waves and just water action has kind of eroded that very thin layer of sand. And so some of it's collapsed. So there's sort of an edge of peat that collapsed and then broke into what looks like those, those boulders. And, and that's why we were able to see it on side scan sonar because the, the boulders of peat are really just these lenses of peat that broke off and they're big enough that you could see it on the sonar. And I thought it was rock. And one of the scuba divers, until one of the scuba divers just picked it up <laughs> and I couldn't, couldn't figure out how he was lifting up a boulder underwater, but it was because it's this organic material that's, that's pretty light. So it was an exposure that then kind of crumbled on itself to make it in those, those boulder-like shapes. We've had a couple of questions regarding carbon dating 
in underwater archaeology. People want to know um, how and and uh, if it's it being underwater, the environment underwater affects the carbon dating results. Mm, good question. So carbon dating is something that um, people have done this for like like shipwrecks. You can do what's called like dendrochronology as well um, on the wood. But we've worked with a number of labs. So I've worked with Beta, I've worked with the University of Arizona, um, a number of different labs that have run samples from Lake Huron. And basically you bring it up from underwater and you dry out the wood slowly. So you break off a small piece um, and then the radiocarbon dating is, has worked great. The particular piece of wood that I mentioned that looks like it might have been modified where there's some problems with the radiocarbon dating, uh, there is the algae and the zebra mussels that are growing on all the hard surfaces. So you have to clean the samples extremely well to make sure that you're not getting contamination from those modern sources. So you don't want to be dating the little fibers of the zebra mussels themselves. Um, for the most part, it works pretty well. We have some people were trying to get interested in working on a problem because we actually have very modern wood that's down there and all the wood is either 9,000 years old or the, the war of 1812, which doesn't really make any sense. So um, overall, as long as you clean it very well and you can date the individual cellular structure of the wood, it's been working extremely well, even though it's been submerged for a long period of time. If anything, it preserves it better for that carbon to be preserved still. One of our viewers asked about how underwater archaeology is helping to find evidence of early migrations into the Americas, specifically along the Pacific coast. Good question. So underwater archaeology and, and kind of the, the peopling of the Western Hemisphere, or the, the peopling of the Americas, it's kind of gone hand in hand. So um, it's actually how I got my start in it. A lot of folks are looking for those pathways, right? How did people get from Southeast Asia over into the Western Hemisphere? In terms of, I'm going to give you not one that's on the West Coast, but the, the side that I mentioned Paige Latson at the very beginning I said was in Florida. Uh, that's one of the oldest archaeological sites that's in the U.S. And that's a really early, you know, early people were living in Florida 14,000 years ago. And that's an underwater site. So that's a fantastic data point. The trick on the Pacific coast is there's actually a lot of tectonic activity. The continental shelf on the Pacific coast, if you even just look at Google Earth, it's not very wide. It's not a very big area. So there's areas that would have been dry land, but not a lot of land to look on. And so um, colleagues that work off the coast of like Baja, California and the Channel Islands, have been doing some of this similar kind of paleo environmental mapping and starting to look for sites that are on the Pacific coast or off the Pacific coast, right? Um, there's nothing like yet. <laughs> they don't have the data point. They don't have the site. That's a very, very, very early site, but people are definitely working on the, that coastal migration hypothesis. Um, I'm gonna go to Alaska and do it there. So the, the folks that were working at the native village of Kotzebue, when we went to talk to them about caribou hunting, there were also mammoth bones all over the place in Alaska. So Alaska would have been part of Beringia, right? That continent where peoples could have come over. Um, and I think that's a really, really, really good place to do some underwater archeology span is rather than trying to find like sort of the end or the middle of that West Coast, um, migration going to Beringia and looking on Beringia itself, the part of it, the part of it that that is submerged. So that's like another, the next underwater archaeology project. Someone asked if you had looked for similar structures in a terrestrial setting in Michigan, mm -hmm. and please acknowledge that your work is done on the bottomlands owned I think I'm trying to read this, hold on. Bottomlands owned by the state of Michigan in courtesy of a permit issued by the DNR. Yes. And, and they commented that they think what you and John O'Shea are finding is pretty impressive and cool. Oh, well, thank you for that part. Uh, so in terms of, yes, okay, so important point. The bottomlands, the Alpena Emerly Ridge is work that is being conducted under a permit from the Michigan Department of Resources. So there's an archaeological permit that we apply for every year um, that is renewed pending a review process. So we do conduct the research under a permit. 
The Alpena Amberley Ridge is also in the borders of the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. So it's one of two now freshwater national marine sanctuaries that is governed and run by NOAA. So I'd like to acknowledge that as well as part of a national marine sanctuary. So looking for similar sites on land in Michigan is tricky because there's a lot of farming and agriculture and plowing that has taken place in Michigan. So the first thing that you would do if you were going to plow a field is to move all the rocks, right? move all the big rocks out of the way. So it's not that it wouldn't be possible that there were sites like that on land and that there might still be fragments of them. Where the sites like this have been found on land are usually places where people don't live, where there hasn't been a lot of agriculture or construction. So that's why there's a lot preserved in the Arctic. There's a lot preserved um, very high up in the Andes Mountains for hunting guanacos. There's a lot that are preserved on the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt um, for hunting gazelles and onagers and things like that. So most of the places where hunting structures are preserved on land is where there isn't a lot of subsequent like human development that's moved the rocks. And thank you for the, the comment about it being impressive and cool. <laughs> Okay, so we had several questions regarding the obsidian. Mm -hmm. um, one of them was if you had, um, if you wanted to have collect any soil samples for micro debitage analysis to find out where have you ever collected uh, samples of micro debitage analysis to identify where some of these like, tools were actually made? Great question. And yes. So a colleague, um, Elisa Sonnenberg, Elizabeth Sonnenberg, did her doctoral dissertation looking at micro debitage from submerged sites in Rice Lake in Canada. So she came and worked on the project for a number of years and is still working on the project um, doing paleo environment, but also looking for micro debitage. So yes, we have collected those samples. Yes, there is micro debitage from the sites in Lake Huron. A lot of where the micro debitage is has been where those larger pieces of debitage have been found. But micro debitage is an extremely important method for identifying submerged sites, right? Not just in Lake Huron, but on all of these things, because when you're when you're making a stone tool, you only have one stone tool at the end. Or if you're like me, you'd have two because you'd break it in half. But you have like a whole cloud and dust field of micro debitage. So it creates a bigger pattern and a bigger signature for archaeologists to find. So micro debitage, yes, has been found on like here in like Huron. It's a really important method moving forward for sites in other places too. There hasn't been obsidian micro debitage yet, incidentally. Okay, so there were some questions regarding the origin of the obsidian, and people asked if it was carried with the group as they migrated east or traded for uh, traded in a trade network. Um, or and um, then there, there was another question that was about whether it was produced by volcanic eruption and found much closer to Lake Huron um, than Oregon. Oh, so that wasn't too many questions, sorry. <laughs> oh no, I, got, I think I'm remembering all of them. If I missed okay. one, tell me. Uh, so the important thing about the obsidian in terms of its source is we didn't just compare it to things that are like in Oregon, right? It got that geochemical signature was compared to obsidian from all over the world, including things that might be closer, right? Like volcanic activity elsewhere. Um, so it is the closest match to central Oregon. Um, and as, a as opposed to something that might be geographically closer. In terms of, yeah, what that means, it's, I, I called it a tale of two flakes because it really is. It's like these tiny things that, that are, are telling us a lot about migratory behavior, but it's just a hint of, of human behavior, right? Uh, so like I said, we don't think it's very likely and it's just kind of an Occam's razor explanation. Like, I don't think it's very likely that a single person walked and the, happened to drop these two flakes. Um, it could be part of a migration. People moved around a lot in the past. Um, I don't know if migration would be the right word, just general movement. Um, definitely probably something like trade and exchange, but all of these words like migration and trade and exchange are words that we use that mean really specific things, you know, in 2022. So we always have to be careful about labeling things in the past in a certain way because trade makes you think, you know, oh, maybe they traded it for something else. What a lot of people have asked about, and I'm like waiting for a student to take this on, 
is to try you know now you have two data points you have wagon tire the source in oregon and then you have the the finds in lake huron so it would be really neat to see if there's wagon tire obsidian kind of down the line in other states in between those two data points then you would have more data to be able to assess those different hypotheses right if it's migration if it's exchange if it's something like that okay there was a question from facebook about how do archaeologists distinguish between a human-made hunting blind and a naturally occurring rock pile excellent question so because some of them look pretty natural <laughs> right so there are geological mechanisms things like ice thrust like a glacier moving rocks or ice like um coming up on the shore things like this that can create lines of rocks so like all things in science you have to have many different independent lines of evidence so for the hunting structures in lake huron it's not just that you know they look like lines but there are there's nothing else that looks like them so there's 60 of these structures that are all a little bit different but it's not like there's a line every you know two feet most of the time they're in places where there's a rock line and then there'll be no other rocks so that's part of it part of it is its comparison to hunting sites from terrestrial sites right all over the place to ones that were known on land some of the ones on land have animal bones with them and archaeological materials with them so you know that they were used for hunting species another independent line of evidence is the artifacts right where the artifacts come from where the artifacts come from is almost just as important as where the artifacts aren't because it gives you that pattern of human behavior it's the same thing like there isn't micro debitage all over the alpina amberley ridge there's micro debitage right at those hunting sites in addition to write the charcoal and things like that so it's not just looking at like a rock line and being like oh that's a natural pile there's a lot of testing that goes into determining if it's cultural versus it's natural so comparative to sites on land um, compared to other features that are on the alpina amberley ridge the artifacts themselves and then the spatial distribution all gives you those independent lines of evidence to confirm that they're cultural Okay, one of our viewers asked, can the age of the seeds be trusted? I heard that Dr. Mike Waters from Center for the Study of First Americans critiqued the date of seeds under footprints from White Sands National Park. Perhaps underwater location of seeds are very different than terrestrial locations. Good question. So the trick with plants sometimes, like seeds, they're circles, they roll around, right? They can move pretty easily. If you think about like pollen, like pollen can get blown around a lot. So usually what you'd want to date are things that are bigger, right? Like the macro botanicals that aren't moving around, like the rooted tree in place would give you more confidence because it hasn't moved because it's rooted, right? As opposed to a seed that can move around a little bit. And you're exactly right, right? Like think of like, water movement you know some of the things on the bottom of that peak could have moved around in, in the sand and the sediment so the radiocarbon dates were taken from multiple materials both at the top and the bottom of the peak and they weren't actually dating they didn't date the seeds themselves i think they might have dated one seed a lot of it was the bigger plant materials that were embedded in the peak and we took dates in the middle of it as well but it's important right because things can blow in so one of the most important things you do as an archaeologist is, is make sure you're dating what you really think you're dating and that it's not what we call invasive or intrusive, right? Things that have kind of snuck in the archaeological site. So if I just had a seed and a date on a seed, I wouldn't tell you that I'm confident how old the sites are in Alpena and Emily Ridge, right? There's dates on many different kinds of materials now. We have so many questions, but I'm going to kind of start winding down. Okay. Um, but the final questions, and, and if there's, you know, you're going to get a transcript of all the questions and stuff. So if you want to respond to people individually later, you're welcome to as well. And you'll see what they've had to say. Um, people have a lot of questions about getting into your field. Mm -hmm. And um, they've asked that what, you know, what your major was and how you got into it. And, you know, what influenced your career as an archaeologist to be an underwater archaeologist? It's like the professor in me is going to come out for a second. Um, I 100% was that kid that watched like the History Channel and the Discovery Channel all the time. 
So I was completely captivated and fascinated by Egypt, like we all are, right? Or these eight, like the Great Wall of China and these, these fascinating, really early archaeological sites. So my sister must be credited for this because I was like, I want to be an archaeologist. And she took an anthropology class when she was in college. And she told me, I think anthropology is what you want to do. And I was like, no, I want to be an archaeologist. But she was right because archaeology is embedded in, in anthropology in the United States. So I knew I wanted to do history. I started out doing classical archaeology. Um, learning ancient Greek was very hard for me. And then I also was introduced to the Galt site, which the Archaeological Conservancy has a hand in protecting the Galt site in Central Texas. And I just completely was like, I want to do the old, old, old past. I find hunter-gatherers so fascinating. I think it's so hard and challenging and unique. Um, and then the underwater thing, it's it just... I, I met somebody in the lab at the at the Galt site when I worked there who had done underwater sites in Florida and he had a, a grant from NOAA to go look in the Gulf of Mexico and was like, come on the boat. And I went and, you know, and that's how all those lines came together. So what I tell my students all the time, like most of the time people are just interested in, in people <laughs> and anthropology gives you a way to study people from a lot of different perspectives. So you kind of got to get your foot in the door, but after that, you'll always find people who are willing to talk to you about archaeology and, and help you on your career for sure. And then there were specific questions where people were asking what kind of programs, if you had recommendations on schools or volunteer opportunities where they could get involved. Yes. Okay. So um, I'm going to try to minimize this without destroying everything. Okay. So I can share a link to a paper that is free um, that I published with Jay Hegler and Nicole Grenon just recently. Um, I will put this in the chat um, that has schools and funding like about field schools and um, that sort of thing. The one thing about, sorry, what did you ask me right after that? Oh, volunteer opportunities. Yes. <laughs> I was trying to, I got it. Sorry. Uh, no matter what, if you're in the United States, look up like the Michigan Archaeological Society or the Texas Archaeological Society. Almost every state in the union has a really fantastic group of people. Sometimes they're professionals, sometimes they're avocationals. They're usually wonderful humans who also like archaeology. Um, and that's a really great way to get involved. I think the Conservancy puts out newsletters like join the archaeological conservancy become a member and you'll get even more information about archaeological sites that are all over the country um and volunteering the deal with the alpina amberley ridge in particular is a little hard because only so many people fit on the boat <laughs> so that's not the easiest place to volunteer um but like if you're in texas the north texas archaeological society is, is fantastic and they do sites all over yeah state archaeological societies they have a lot of volunteer opportunities and I put the link in the chat to an article, it's called Getting Your Feet Wet, um, but it does list specific programs, at least in the US, um, for where to go for grad school, at least for underwater archeology. span And I'll also I'll copy that link. I'll put it on the web page for your event so people can visit that page and find the link okay. to your new book and the link to your paper. Thank you. So, um, do you have any parting thoughts, Ashley, before we close out tonight? I just want to say thank you again, April, to you um, and the Archaeological Conservancy. I think you do fantastic, fantastic work. And thank you to all the members that came. Um, I'm seeing my students in the chat, too. So thank you all. Um, as if you don't get enough of me Monday through Friday. Um, and yeah, just thank you so much for everyone. I'm, I'm always happy to answer other questions. Um, you can always reach out to me via email as well. And have a wonderful night. Thank you very, very much. It was wonderful. And thank everyone for coming this evening. Our next virtual lecture will be um, on March 10th, I believe. And uh, you can check out our website and we'll see you then. Have a great evening. Thanks again, Dr. Lemke.